A business at the end of the day is really just a group of people reaching the same goal. And whatever you can do to help a better cohesive team really help your business, whether this be better communication, better interpersonal skills, all this will allow for a more successful business. Today we speak with Katie, the founder of the McLaughlin Method, and how she, with her background within theater and the corporate world, has come together to really end boring theory-based training. We go over the benefits of developing a strong corporate culture, as well as how leaders can become better leaders by having better communication skills. We also speak about the transition between the theater and the corporate world, and how there's a lot of real transferable skills, because at the end of the day, how you communicate is a transferable skill no matter what you do. Hope you enjoy this episode, a little bit more about different ways of training yourself as a leader, and check out the McLaughlin Method to see if you or your team can become better at having fun and communicating. Cool. So I am Katie McLaughlin. I'm the founder, chief strategist, and transformation artist at McLaughlin Method. And through my business, we are transforming team connections and team cultures and helping leaders and teams to build inclusive behaviors using theater. That is one of our special secret sauces uh, involved in the McLaughlin method. And yeah, so, I mean, theater is very interesting. Obviously, like anything in life, public speaking, having communication is so important no matter, no matter the role. How did you get into that? Like, do you have a theater background? And then from there you realized, oh, hey, you know, businesses might need this or kind of how that all start. Because I feel that typically what we've seen is, you know, like if folks in the arts tend to really stay in the arts or like it's rarely do we see kind of transitions between different fields. So how did you kind of get involved in theater to start off? And then what kind of made you realize, oh, hey, maybe other teams could benefit from the things I learned through my experiences? Yeah, so I have a theater degree. My undergraduate degree is in theater. And but I didn't just study theater. I went, didn't go to a mm-hmm. conservatory program. I went to a liberal arts school and, you know, studied a whole variety of different things. And by the time I was graduating, I realized, okay, I'm not the person who's going to move to New York and, you know, try mm-hmm. to make it. Uh, that was not not in the cards for me. And so, you know, through my career and us- utilizing a lot of the other skills that I have around like project management and, um, you know, design skills and overall people skills, training, et cetera, you know, I, I built a career in the business world where I was leading teams, leading people, helping leaders to onboard new hires and to interview in a way that is inclusive and gets at real, you know, behaviors rather than just uh, ideas, uh, right? And so kind of through my experience of being in the business world, leveraging a whole variety of different skills that my theater education really helped to hone and, and to proliferate and help me to apply in different areas. I then realized that part of what I had learned about how to interact with people uh, through my theater degree and also thinking about, you know, certain things like the show must go on is Mm -hmm. a common phrase uh, that happens in the theater world. And that has always helped me to meet deadlines and, you know, to Mm -hmm. try to push to, to make that happen or to, you know, kind of have that line in the sand around like a launch. Um, So Mm -hmm. frequently in business, we see launches being pushed back and like dates being changed all the time. And in the theater, you can't do that. You need to, you need to be able to open when Mm -hmm. people have tickets. Uh, So, you know, learning how to manage, manage to a deadline uh, was super important in theater. And that has been super important as a person in business. Mm -hmm. Um, And I've, And all of the skills just really compound from there. There's so many other things that I've learned uh, how to articulate and connect some of my skills that I've used in the workplace back Mm -hmm. to my theater background. And so I teach those concepts and skills to leaders, to teams. uh, And then I also use some theater exercises within Mm -hmm. my workshops to help people to build empathy and to connect with one another and share more of what's really going on. And that's great. And I think that's one thing you touched on so important is that at the end of the day, every business is just people and people having conversations. Like everyone likes to make it, you know, much more complex. There's VPs or C-level, but it's just people talking to people. And the better you can talk, things get done a lot better. And really, it's a lot easier to move forward. And I feel that's sometimes lost. And I think obviously working from home made people realize that 
so much of our communication in person is body language and other things like that, which you always take for granted until you're on a phone and you realize, oh, it's a little bit harder to talk on a phone than in person sometimes, or for some people it's easier. So I like how you touched on the fact that like, like life worlds, everything's interconnected at some point and human interactions are at the key to almost everything, especially in business. So, you know, kind of growing through this, I, and I've, I wouldn't say dabble in theater, but obviously in high school and university is always that theater thing. And like anything, and I bet that you probably face this a lot as well, especially in the corporate world, is that people always tend to be a little bit sassy. They're always like, no, this is not from, I, I don't want to do this. And how do you kind of break through that barrier? Because obviously for most, it is is a little bit intimidating. No one's submitted, but talking in front of a group of people or kind of expressing yourself can be challenging. So have you found that maybe, I mean, obviously you've worked with, I mean, for people over these years, have you found that it's become maybe easier for people to express express themselves, or have you found that it's just always been a challenge, just because it's so intimidating for lots of people? Yeah. So you know, in some ways, some people like will self select, and some companies, right, wouldn't choose mm-hmm. to hire me because they wouldn't be open to, I'd say, non traditional methods of teaching, mm-hmm. right? But you know, what I found is that a lot of a lot of leaders and a lot of teams and a lot of companies are seeing that a lot of the old methods for training and a lot of the old methods for especially developing leaders aren't working. You don't have to mm-hmm. lead, you don't learn how to lead a person by reading a textbook, right? And you don't learn how to interact with a human being and give them feedback by taking an online course. Not usually, mm-hmm. right? There's still a pretty big jump that you have to make between I'm learning this thing and learning what the best practices are. And like intellectually, I can understand those. But when it comes to I'm talking directly with a human and practicing, even the simple mm-hmm. act of rehearsing, right, is something huge that we don't do enough of. We just think, oh, I'm just going to wing it, right? And people will say, oh, I hate role plays and training and things mm-hmm. like that. Uh, But the point of doing those is so that way we're not messing up in a pretty high stakes conversation. And I would say anytime a leader is talking with somebody who works for them, the stakes are higher than they think. And so Mm -hmm. keeping that in mind uh, is super important for any leader to be thinking about. I think that makes a lot of sense, especially the fact that Conversation is so important. Understanding how and practice is so important. I think that's one of the things I've seen a lot is that you always, you'll meet people who just will say, you know, they're naturally good public speakers or they have a natural talent. And for sure, there are some people who are more gifted. But most of the times you look at those people, especially within the corporate world, it's like it's like anything else. It's just hours. Maybe they did Toastmasters or they, Funny enough, a lot of people with siblings who maybe have, like, they, they always have to speak up for themselves or have a theater background or were on a sports team with, like, a team-based sport. So I think it's one of those things where I know this was for me growing up where I always thought, oh, I'm a bad public speaker because that's just not me. Like, I can't do it because I'm not good at it Till I realized or talk to a few people and they're like, oh, no, like, I practice. I think a lot of times people in, interpret that to be a speaker, have conversation is a almost a na- ner- um, you're born with it and most of the right. time it's not it is like you said you have to have the rehearsal so that people who tend to wing it well or classic improv and it almost broke my heart when i realized improv there's like a this is not there's a method to improv i thought it was just made up completely till i'm like oh my goodness there's a process and i think that's with everything once you kind of learn how even great public speakers in the business world that wing it there's always a method or a process behind it it just seems like a secret until you know it and then you're like Oh, life's a lot easier. There's a method behind this. Yeah. And even, you know, improv is a good uh, comparison because I, (laughs) you know, people think, yeah, that, yeah, we just show up. Um, And I'm a, I'm a trained improviser (laughs) uh, and I emphasize trained, right? That there is training involved on, on how to improvise. Uh, But most importantly, it's a skill that has to continue to be (laughs) worked and utilized. And so most improv troops, they're doing a lot of rehearsals and they're continuing to keep those muscles warm. Mm -hmm. Uh, And it's the same kind of thing. If we go, you know, two years without ever meeting somebody in person, right, as we've all just gone through with the pandemic, you know, we have to sometimes prepare for that kind of new meeting and realize, hey, I'm probably bringing in some new emotions into that conversation than I normally would when I'd go see somebody in person uh, or go to an event. 
Uh, you know, many people I know are kind of just going to some of their first events. Maybe some people are traveling for the first time. All of those different things, emotions come up. And I bring up that because we act from an emotional place more than mm-hmm. we realize, especially in the workplace. And so a lot of the work that I do with people after we've played some games and get people used mm-hmm. to kind of sharing a little bit um, in a safe way, then we start to use our bodies to express emotions. So you don't have to say, oh, I feel scared when this thing happens. Uh, you know, someone might throw up an image using their facial expressions, mm-hmm. their arms, they might have their hands in front of their face and mm-hmm. kind of be cringing. Like that's that image communicates a lot of words and a lot of feelings, mm-hmm. right? And we can all relate to going into a conversation or a situation where you feel that way. We've all felt that way in a lot of different situations. And I think what you touched on is quite interesting. So I think one of the things that people don't realize, especially now that things are slowly opening up again, is the practice required. Um, one of the big popular things, I mean, uh, pretty, I love comedy and I kind of looked into that a lot. And like a lot of the comedians coming, coming back, even the super large ones all said, I need my stage time. And I've been doing comedy for 30 years, but two years off, I'm bad. I'm rough. I need that. And one thing that was really interesting, kind of speaking about this idea of practice is that most comedians to become comedians do stand up every single day for like 20 years, every single day or multiple sets. And that was shocking to me. I was like, wait, you're worth millions of dollars and you're practicing every day. Like, why can't you just do it? And that was almost eye opening for, I think it's for anything. Like you talk to a good sales leader and they're always like, Hey, for the cold call, I'm doing hundreds of calls. I'm listening. I'm practicing. And then after 15 years, you're like, Oh wow, he's a natural. It's like, Nope. There was hours of practicing this. And I think a lot of people don't realize it or a lot of people don't realize what they're practicing until they kind of look back and, or you look into someone's history. So for a lot of these, I guess, when you're working with a team, what are some of the challenges you tend to find? Like, is there a lot of, I guess this is great. Is there a lot of misconceptions that come with people, you know, you're bringing in your, more of your theory background. Is there some mis- common misconceptions people have that are hesitant or that kind of prevent them from understanding that after obviously a few minutes, they really understand like, oh, this is what it meant. What are, what is that like light bulb for most people? Do you think when they realize, oh, this is beneficial? So, you know, I think some of the misconceptions are people assuming that they're going to be uh, having kind of their worst nightmare of like a public speaking situation, <laughs> right? You know, people always describe that whole idea of like being, you know, put on the spot with these like, you know, spotlights on you and you are feeling uh, like completely unprepared, right? So I'd say that's like what so- some of the most, like the highest resistance would be kind of more in that camp. Um, you know, whereas some of the like lighter resistance that happens, even when people have already signed up to join a workshop mm-hmm. or signed up to kind of, um, you know, do a coaching with me that, you know, we kind of play small, like it doesn't feel normal mm-hmm. to, uh, we're so used to like being in our little virtual box. Cause most of my programming mm-hmm. is virtual. Um, mm-hmm. and so, you know, people aren't used to like raising their hands up in, uh, you know, in their little video. Right. And so we do mm-hmm. a variety of little exercises to warm people up to get people used to doing things outside of the norm that we're used to in being in a virtual call, Mm -hmm. a virtual classroom. And, and because I craft and architect kind of the Mm -hmm. sessions in that way, by the time we get to doing something where people need to be a little bit more vulnerable and reveal some of these emotions um, and some of these feelings, they already have a sense of community in the class and all of those first couple of examples we do as a group so part Mm -hmm. of why i love doing this as a group is it it's an equalizer so when every person is responding to the exact same prompt which might look like create an image of uh what you feel like or how you Mm -hmm. enter into a uh, feedback conversation Mm -hmm. with your manager right people go and create an image and I give them a three, two, one action. And then they all create their images at the same time. Mm -hmm. And so nobody's being put on the spot at first. um, And we get a chance to see everyone's response and see the similarities and the differences. I think I, I mean, you really touch on the fact that like working, like you say, working your way up, it's not intense. I mean, everyone's a little bit nervous. You have to kind of realize, Hey, 
everyone's nervous here. Let's kind of speak with the elephant in the room and work your way up to being able to express yourself as a group. And I think that's, like you said, I think that's a challenge. And I think everyone, and I think that's the biggest misconception is everyone else seems like, oh, you're not afraid because you've done it before. Hey, you're public speaker, so you should be not nervous. But everyone's nervous. And I always find that funny that the best athletes, everyone, they're always nervous to go. But it's, as silly as it sounds, it's like using that nerves for the benefit or using it to energize yourself. And you never realize until you kind of learn about how to manage your emotions, like you said, it becomes way more effective. It's like, okay, I'm nervous, but so is everyone else. But I just need to get more comfortable in this situation. So, you know, you really, like you said, you have a lot of experience in the corporate world and you've, you've been doing this with theater, kind of mixing the two genres together. What made you kind of take the steps further and start your own organization? Because I feel that that's always a little bit of a jump, a little bit, again, a little bit nerve wracking, kind of fearful, because even though you've had success working with other organizations, what made you say, hey, you know what, I want to try to take this and kind of go on for myself or try and develop something for myself. What was that point or what kind of what was that transition into that? whole mentality. So I've been kind of hatching this business idea Mm. for a long time and wasn't entirely sure what format I wanted the business to even take. You know, I studied a lot of the theater techniques that I've described on this conversation Mm -hmm. and that I use in my, in my method, I learned back in college. And so Mm -hmm. there are things I've, I've learned and studied for a long time. And I knew that they could be really impactful for a number of people. And so I've had to kind of sit on that and kind of let that marinate and consider where Mm -hmm. could I bring this? How could I do this? Um, You know, some of my first workshops that I did for the public um, were back in 2015, and I didn't start my business until 2020. And so, Mm -hmm. you know, I was kind of testing things out. And, you know, I started my business, uh, quite frankly, after being laid off. Uh, I was working for a consulting group that ended up needing to do some downsizing uh, because of the pandemic. And, you know, at that point, I realized that I'd learned enough about being a consultant and that just by being a consultant, being somebody from coming, coming in from the outside, that added extra weight to Mm -hmm. my opinion, to my skills, to the advice I was giving. And so it really felt like a natural fit to be able to start my own business. And that also gives me a lot of control over, you know, the clients I work with Mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, kind of really making sure that different folks are able to be present and aren't, aren't just coming from that resistance place. Like you're just like you described earlier. Mm -hmm. And we talked about, I think it's, it's most important that when I work with a client that they already have a sense, even a basic sense of what they're getting themselves into and that they're not, they don't come into a session completely surprised. Like, wait, you're going to ask me to move around and do things. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah. I think that's one of the important things with any business is realizing like choosing the right customer. I think people always talk about getting all the customers, acquiring everyone, trying to grow as fast as possible, trying to get as many customers as possible. But then you realize like we were saying on like having a good, product market fit, I guess some people call it, but having a good understanding of these are the customers I want to work with that understand what I'm offering. And that synergistic relationship tends to create the best results. And it's so important to realize that not every organization works well, but for the people that do work well, there is a really that end result. And I think that's for all entrepreneurs and all startups. That's always a challenging thing when someone's like, hey, we want to give you money. And you have to say, I'm sorry, but I'm not the right person for you. Maybe consider this. And at first people think they're like, no, that, you know, every customer is great. I have many friends who are photographers and they were like, oh, I don't, they're at first like, I'll do every wedding. And then they're like, okay, unless there was like food for me, unless there's all, like they start getting contracts. People think that's wild. But then you realize it's a two-way street. You also have to enjoy what you're doing. And I figure out at the end of the day, people forget that you kind of have to enjoy your job and having great customers really helps you get fulfillment out of that. With obviously you said, you know, you started this during COVID times and really remote times. And I'm assuming before primarily the work you were doing is very much in-person focused um, as most, I would assume, yeah. of these types of works would be done. What were, you know, obviously things can be done virtually well now, but when you were kind of that early transition, what were some of the big, I guess, firstly, what transitioned over well or was surprisingly transitioned over well that you maybe thought wouldn't either be as easy or 
was just shocking that people really understood virtually that you didn't know beforehand. Yeah. So I think everybody struggled with that virtual transition Mm -hmm. at first. Right. And it really was about testing and, and about Mm -hmm. trying some things out. And so in some of my early days of deciding to do a business, uh, you know, and really kind of go down that path, you know, I did some kind of free invite only, you know, kind of practice workshops. Mm -hmm. I even did a guest lecture at a college course. Uh, And, you know, each of those examples gave me the opportunity to test things out and see, do I have to explain things differently in order to make myself understood and kind of get people on the same page? Um, I've found that, you know, by us being virtual, that I have to I have to model certain things like I have to do do something crazy or do some like, you know, examples of what I'm talking about in order for people to understand, you know, kind of first and foremost, yeah. whereas in a in-person setting, there's kind of an organic way that I can teach them while they're doing it mm-hmm. uh, without me having to kind of model or, or put too many ideas in their head. So, um, so yes, yeah, so that's been a little bit of what I have done. Mm-hmm. Um, something that really surprised me, I never thought that I could do this work one-on-one. Mm-hmm. I always thought it had to be a group because of mm-hmm. some of the benefits I described before of like being able to see the similarities that people have and, mm-hmm. and seeing the differences, right? And being able to appreciate the diversity of ideas and the diversity of expe- of perspectives. Mm-hmm. But I I had someone approach me who like knew my work well and knew me well. And uh, she was like, Katie, this thing happened with my team. I, I just need like an hour of your time. I will pay you. I just like need to know what to do about this situation. Mm-hmm. And I was like, okay. So, you know, got on the call and, you know, was able to rely on my training as a, as a, you know, facilitator, as an improviser, mm-hmm. uh, to be able to really be in the moment with her and help her dissect and kind of pick apart what had happened in this conversation where, her employee kind of blew up at her and she was not remotely expecting it. And then Mm -hmm. how she could try to approach that type of conversation in the future in a stronger way. And all of that was really using theater to help break down the conversation, break down all of the transition points and the kind of emotional reactions that were happening. And Mm -hmm. that served as like our objective springboard to talking about these different power dynamics we have in at play Mm -hmm. in the workplace these expectation differences, uh, things like that. And I was really surprised it went really well. And, and it, now it's an offering, uh, mm-hmm. as part of my business where I can continue to do that with, with other folks. And I think that's so interesting. Like many others, when it comes to starting a business, like a lot of times where the business goes, what develops is shocking or like you think, Hey, it's not, shouldn't work, but it does work great. And then you always hear those interesting stories of, I wouldn't say, happy almost like happy accidents like oh hey like we don't really do this but let's give it a shot and then that could be huge revenue uh, avenues for a business one thing that i always found i i guess even though even through like the past few years and maybe it could also be my point of view as well is that i've been hearing a lot more and when, even when i went to, back to business school almost it was very common that everyone would say if you want to get better go take theater like all the business I was even working with, they said, they're like, hey, what's the tip for your sales reps? They're like, we recommend they all do an improv. Like we offer improv classes to go forward and do this. Have you found that that maybe are more businesses or from your opinion, more people realizing the power of going to more of these art forms to really develop skills and interpersonal skills and people skills? Have you seen the acceptance or movement towards that more? Or do you think we're still kind of in the early stages of people realizing that you can develop business skills from things that I guess you would say or aren't considered like business focus. So you don't have to go, re- like you said, read a textbook to be like, how did X CEO do this? Let me read all about it, but more expressing themselves, learning how to communicate. Have you seen more organizations over, even over your career, kind of more interest in moving towards that? Or you think it's still one of those like hidden secrets that a lot of these great communicators know about that others don't. So I think it's probably a little bit of all of that. Right. Where, you know, Mm -hmm. what I've found, because a lot of my 
a lot of my early career has mm -hmm. been in the startup world. And I'd say that mm -hmm. the startup world has tended to be more open to creative uh, career pathing, creative mm -hmm. solutions to problems, right? Startups mm -hmm. are all about innovation. And so I would say that that world has often been very pro, let's try something new, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas as I've worked with more mature companies that, you know, have been around for decades, they have thousands of employees, those companies are a bit more stuck in their ways or need to kind of have a, a significant body of proof around mm. how this has worked and that they need to have somebody really refer them into, uh, into the mm -hmm. company as well, like, and have someone kind of be like, oh, I've already taken something with them. I could vouch for that. Um, so, you know, there's that kind of whole spectrum. And I would say that those larger companies are probably less likely to invest in a program like mine uh, to start. You know, I think it would take a few people be going, coming, self-selecting to come into my program first uh, mm -hmm. before the company would approach me. Um, mm -hmm. But I would say overall in the last, you know, number of decades, Mm -hmm. A lot of improv troops have been doing what what they call corporate improv. And it's usually improv classes teaching improv skills to business people. And usually that's for the express purpose of, you know, building team unity, creativity, uh, innovation, uh, critical thinking skills. It's for that mm -hmm. kind of work rather than the work that I'm doing, which is more about empathy building, diversity and inclusion skill building, mm -hmm. uh, leadership, you know, leadership skill building. Mm -hmm. um, and because I'm trying to get at a, a, a different layer of depth, I would say, in mm -hmm. terms of kind of the heart of these people communications. But mm -hmm. I'm really grateful that corporate improv has become more popular and more of a thing that people aren't mm -hmm entirely closed off to the idea of theater being part of of people's programming mm -hmm. um and part of what i also think makes my programming different is that mm -hmm. you know i have a ton of business acumen myself and so you know not only can i bring in this cool method that's going to teach mm -hmm. different skills and help people to connect in a different way i'm also bringing in you know decades of experience in the business world and you know, business savvy and consulting skills and all of mm -hmm. that. And so that kind of marriage uh, of those skill sets and those perspectives is something that I don't see happening as much from the corporate improv side. I think that's so interesting. I think one of the things that's really required is the fact that you have to have experience in both. I think that's one of the challenges we've seen almost for or any industry trying to merge together is that you need someone who understands both very well to understand where the connections are. Um, just because one thing works in one scenario doesn't always mean it translates well. We've seen this in many other industries, many other businesses where it's like, oh, even in, even in people, I think that's one thing where I've seen a lot in similar to, I've worked, I mean, I've worked with a lot of startups where a founder or a, a leader who can run a 50 person company, great, maybe very bad out of running a thousand person company. And in your head, you're like, well, it's the same thing. Like it's, leading but n yeah. and I, as you know like it's dramatically different and that's one of the reasons you need those leadership skills because the requirements change you can no longer have coffee with everyone every day and become friends with them you're you have to realize like okay there's a thousand people now i have to conduct myself i have to speak different because i and i've talked to many seals where they say you know, we hire 10 new people every week or 100 new people every week i possibly cannot meet everyone I don't know who half my employees are, but yet I have to still always be, I have to be the leader for them. So I have to be able to conduct myself in a way. And that is always seems to be a, almost like a growing pain or a growing stressor for a lot of organizations is understanding that leadership style changes. The way you communicate has to change. All these things are, I wasn't taken for granted, but are challenging and you have to kind of grow with it. And like I, as you spoke about it, you have to really understand the process behind it because it is challenging. It is different. And what worked in the past will not work. will probably will not work well in the future. Um, and we've always, we've always seen those challenges. Yeah. You know, I want to touch on that because seeing so many different startups that I've worked with as mm -hmm. well, um, and especially, you know, I'm here in the Seattle area. I've gotten to mm -hmm. know a lot more uh, early stage uh, founders in the startup world. And mm -hmm. what I have seen is that 
even going from, you know, two, three, five employees to 10 to 15 can be a huge dump for a founder to start orienting themselves that they can't be in every single conversation. And many startups seem to place intentional energy on what does it mean to be an employee at our company? What does it mean to be part of our team? What's our team culture? Mm -hmm. That doesn't usually happen until later, maybe sometimes after Mm -hmm. 30 employees or more. But culture starts as soon as you hire somebody else. Um, And every interaction builds habits uh, and oftentimes bad habits at first, right? We can kind of get away with some bad habits when there's only one or two people uh, that we need to be communicating with. But if we don't correct those behaviors and habits Mm -hmm early, then those just continue to proliferate and then become really big problems uh, when you have tens of hundreds of employees uh, under Mm -hmm. you. And exactly with that, one thing that's interesting in startups is when a company, like you said, culture starts on day one. And a lot of times with small companies, um, I think there's five like key factors that affect culture. But one of the big things is the like founders culture, the founders views. But just like anything with dilution or adding water to anything, the bigger you get the founder's mission vision gets less and less because they don't have control over it. And then you get to the thing where I always found, I didn't find it silly, but it's always interesting. Like the hiring good people is so important when you're a small company because they're people you hire, they start developing the culture and it's, it's like anything else. It's the classic, like, you know, if you have a child and you set it free and then they start making friends and they start developing their own personality, that's the same with the business. And everyone, everyone always likes to compare businesses to children, but it's the same thing where when you have more employees now, they're learning by themselves. They, they may have some bad influences. They may have some good influences. And even, you know, as a founder, you can try to help it. But after, like you said, once there's these bad, whether it be bad processes or kind of these inefficiencies early on and you start growing, this gets it's a lot harder to change. So understanding early on, like you said, you have to understand that culture part. And I think culture is something that I always like to say it's when times are good, culture matters, but seems to matter less. It's like anything in life. When you're winning, you're making money, you're like, oh, this is great. But once there's a little hiccup, this is when all these companies are all of a sudden saying, oh, we have a bad culture. Oh, our culture is the issue. But your culture never changed. It was just that nothing goes wrong. You're like, oh, I'm happy. I don't have to worry about it. But once there's a little pressure, it's like a friendship. Once thing, a little thing goes wrong, you really start seeing who your real friends are, as silly as it sounds. But that's the same thing with culture, the idea that you really have to be very conscious of it, no matter what size you are. And the bigger you get, the less control you have as a founder and as a team. And that's why employees are so important and that people matter. But um, yeah, and I, I like how you really s- spoke about that, because that's something that I feel is like you said, for 50 employees, you hire an HR person and then they figure out the culture. Their job's to develop the culture, but you can't do that. It's no. like, it's, and I feel like that's always a common thing where we hired, I've talked to startups, but we hired an HR person now to develop our culture. And it's like, well, I don't think you understand what culture is. And it's a little bit too late if mm-hmm. you're getting to that point. So um, yeah. I guess one well, of the things like, yeah, go ahead. And culture is what drives people's overall experience working at the company. And it's not just the swag you provide or the events that you have, you know, it's all of those in between moments. It's how you ask somebody for a status report. It's how you barge in on someone's call when, uh, when you're in the office or Mm -hmm. when you just kind of join a random meeting that people aren't expecting, Mm -hmm. like all of those things are little experiences of culture and too infrequently leaders do exactly what you were describing Mm -hmm. right but every leader has the most influence over the people that directly report to them and Mm -hmm. i'm sure people know this quote that people don't leave companies people leave bosses and so Mm -hmm. if you're a boss culture is your job because people leave because of how they feel they're being treated by you And so you need to make culture kind of your number one priority, because if you have unhappy people, those unhappy people produce errors. Those unhappy people are terrible to your customer Mm -hmm. and your unhappy people don't meet, you know, their different performance guidelines and and they don't meet deadlines. So employee happiness really is one of the biggest keys to business success that is 
untapped. It happiness and efficiency are so huge. I think one thing work from home taught us is that, and I mean, I think everyone realizes this is that because you work 40 hours a week doesn't mean you work 40 hours a week. Like you can spend hours doing something that could take you 10 minutes most of the time. And I think working from home, maybe people realize the idea that, oh, I don't have to sit on my chair for you know nine to five. I can go places. And as long as I get my work done, my boss tends to be happy. And, oh, maybe I am not working. Or maybe it's like, hey, I am very busy. Or, you know what, maybe I was just lazy in the office. I know so many people. I know many who are like, you show up to the office, you grab a coffee, then you'll get your lunch, then you'll go take a break, and then, you know, the day's over. And then you realize, you know, I was very productive today. I spent, you know, 10 hours at the office, but you really did nothing. And I think that's very um, apparent now that we have more time to, like, look in yourself and kind of introspect yourself and realize, oh, there's more efficiency. I can do a lot more. And happiness is one of those key things that it's so hard to track and sounds so numbery in the sense of like what's your employee efficiency but that is one of the biggest things a good leader can bring is that you can get more done with the same amount of people and they're happy to do it there is more fulfillment from their work and fulfillment is i once was talking to a um pretty high up executive and he said which is an interesting fact he used to always ask you what does work-life balance mean to you and we always get a different answer which is interesting for something every company talks about and he said that the hours to him didn't matter. He used to work crazy long hours, but he said, when I came home, I still had energy to play with my kid. And that's when I knew I was fulfilled. I was happy. And then the research states that this is a little bit separate, but kind of interesting with like fulfillment idea was that they did a test where it was like, okay, you know, would, would working hard affect your children growing up? Like would not like saying you're working from like nine to seven, is that more detrimental or is it like nine to five type thing? You're perfect. You have the perfect work life balance. And they realized that it wasn't about the hour. It wasn't about the hour spent. It was about the quality of time. That like people remember the good impacts. And the same thing with being a leader. Just because you have a team you might see every day, that doesn't mean they like you more. They're more impactful. But the impactful moments are a matter at the end of the day. Um, I guess everything always comes back to raising children, raising a company seems to be the exact same thing at the end of the day because all these stories tend to intertwine. But it's very interesting, yeah. especially. And, that intertwining like really brings up something else that I teach in a mm -hmm. lot of my programming is that is how we already have these skills and we mm -hmm. just need to learn how to transfer them to the workplace. And if, if you looked at or followed any kind of like leadership or um, mm -hmm. HR related kind of blog or learning anything, um, you know, the notion of transferable skills is also kind of, you know, a hot topic, right? We're always trying to figure out how do we get kind of transferable skills? How do I mm -hmm. proliferate my career by having these transferable skills? And what I always tell people is that if you've exhibited a skill in one area of your life, that means that you can transfer it to another area of your life. Mm -hmm. You just haven't figured out how to put that kind of piece from one area mm -hmm. into another. Um, but you still already have that skill. So sometimes tapping into the experience when you've already been using that skill. So say you're, um, say you're really good at maybe setting a boundary with your kids mm -hmm. of, um, you know, bedtime or something, mm -hmm. right? You, that means you have some skills in articulating a boundary, communicating your mm -hmm. needs, uh, dealing with conflict, right? You know, <laughs> Those are all like micro skills that you have and you just need to practice using them in the workplace setting or, you know, in a different setting. Mm -hmm. That's so funny you touch on that because I always say the best management training I ever had was when I worked at summer camp and had to deal with hundreds of children. And I said, children don't listen. In a corporate world, people tend to listen because their job is on the line. Where child has no reason to listen to you. You have to like very quickly build, get their respect understand, compromise, and kind of get the ball rolling from there. And I always said that was the greatest uh, training I had because adults are much, in my opinion, much easier to talk to, uh, and they're less likely to run away from you because offices tend not to like that. So right. that's, uh, I, like you said, transfer, you have the skills, transferring them is so important. Um, and funny thing that reminds me of is also kind of jumping back a bit that like culture is not, it's always my kind of a little bit of my, uh, be my bond is that culture is not a ping pong table. That the idea also is like you said, it's about those interactions of talking to people. 
Um, so obviously like things have been growing, things have been going well you, with all your experiences and kind of, like you said, having new offerings, what does the next, what, what does the future look for, for you and your organization? Like, is there new ways of expanding? Is it regional based? Like how, how, how does the future look for uh, you and kind of your growth going forward? Well, so the early pieces that I can see coming up in the next mm -hmm. year is really getting back to doing some in-person work because mm -hmm. I believe that some of the most profound uh, changes and aha moments can happen in an in-person workshop. And so I've been experimenting with ideas on how I might test the waters here a little bit in Seattle, mm -hmm. uh, but I'm definitely open to traveling for a company as opposed to just doing their work virtually. Um, mm -hmm. So that's in the short term, you know, but in the long term, I, I do hope to have a uh, you know, a retreat center that like executive teams or leadership teams could come and do mm -hmm. offsites at and, you know, really kind of get away from ev everything that's going on in their company so that way they can have mm -hmm. that intentional time to learn about themselves, grow as a team, and then also make some conscientious, intentional choices about about their culture and about their company. Um, and maybe there'll be regional, regional retreat centers and regional offices, but mm -hmm. uh, who knows? That's exciting. I think those retreats are obvious, so important. Just to be like you said, step away from the office and have a. Again, I'm connected back to dogs you now because I have two dogs in my house right now who are like very, they're not mad at each other, but they just don't realize that they both live in the same house. Like my little dog thinks he lives here when he doesn't. He's just visiting. But it's like having, like you said, having neutral ground, like going somewhere, having neutral ground where we can all learn and accept and have those boundaries down. Um, today I'm just filled with analogies because I'm dealing with that little dog drama over here as we speak. But uh, yeah, so if people kind of want to get in touch and get involved more, what's the best way to get in contact with you and learn more about kind of what you do? Yes, yeah, so people can reach me at mclaughlinmethod.com. And uh, I'm also on LinkedIn, both as McLaughlin Method and, and Katie McLaughlin. So please feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn, follow me there. I'm always talking about uh, leadership and uh, ways that you can connect with your team better. Um, and if you'd like, I also have a blog on my website as well.